Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. Thank you to all of you who watched my Album of the Year 2022 video. It was great to be back after 12 months of not doing anything. Lovely to chat to you all in the comments section and uh, if you're here, thanks for being here again. Just a reminder that if you want to catch up with me, send me DMs, follow the music that I'm recommending on a regular basis, do follow me on Instagram at Oliver J. Kemp. There's a uh, link there in the top right hand corner of the screen. So today I want to tell you why Fugazi is the greatest band of all time. Now, of course, I'm being provocative. There's no such thing as the greatest band of all time. That's a ridiculous sentiment, right? Wrong. No, 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 I'm, I'm just kidding. Or am I? Over 15 years, Washington DC's post-hardcore legends Fugazi were unlike anything else in the world of music. Aside from the actual music they made, which to call post-hardcore is at this point quite reductive and does a disservice to how varied their sound was, they had an entire ethos that, as a person who cares about social justice, only strengthens the legacy of this group. I've got five reasons why Fugazi is the greatest band of all time, but before we get there, maybe just a couple of little details for those of you who haven't experienced the band before and don't really know much about them. Fugazi's a weird word. What does it mean? Fucked up, got ambushed, zipped in, in a body bag. Who was in Fugazi? Ian Mackay, co-founder of Discord Records and before Fugazi was frontman of Minor Threat. Joe Lally, who formed the band with Ian back in 1987, an amazing bassist with a really melodic, dub-influenced approach to bass lines. Guy Pichotto, formerly part of Rites of Spring, you've probably seen this image of him inside a basketball hoop at an early Fugazi show, absolutely iconic. And Brendan Canty, probably one of the greatest live drummers who started out in Rites of Spring with Guy. They formed in 1987 and then split in 2002. Sorry, the wording is indefinite hiatus, but you know, based on the really cautious responses the band has given any time they've been asked about whether they're gonna get back together, I don't have a great deal of hope there. So the first reason Fugazi are the greatest band. Reason number one, their musicality. Getting right down to basics, Fugazi should be your favorite band just because they sound so fucking good. This is a group of musicians that cut their teeth alongside prominent bands in DC, making up the hardcore punk scene that developed in the city. From the emergence of hardcore punk came bands experimenting more with their sound and moving away from some of the tropes that were plaguing the scene. You know, some of those negatives like knobheads slam dancing and moshing in crowds, or uh, the unfortunate co-opting of, of live shows by uh, re extreme right-wing skinheads that can't have ever actually listened to the lyrics that were being sung on stage. With more melody and the use of more varied song structures, we get that term post-hardcore, which Fugazi are lumped in with. They quite literally came after hardcore's immediate heyday, taking the intensity of that music but applying musical ideas in increasingly interesting ways. Bassist Joe Lally brought an exuberant, bouncing style of bass playing that had its influences in dub and lock in so perfectly with Brendan Canty's unpredictable drum rhythms. If you listen carefully there, there are even elements of funk in there. In the same way, Ian and Guy's guitar lines interlock because there's a clear demarcation between who does what. Guy's high lead lines are lacerating and possess the same spirit as Joe's weaving bass, whereas Ian's rhythmic chords and lines underpin the tracks. Just listen to Repeater, the title track from their debut record. The back lines agitated and fidgety, and those palm-muted guitar hits from Ian just push up that agitation even more, and then Guy punches into the track with squealing noise. Dynamic contrasts were absolutely mastered by this band. On Shut the Door, the half-time languor of the bass and drums is joined with these 12th fret pinch harmonics. And then we have this brutal pre-chorus and chorus that scarpers that kind of languorous feeling, and Ian's shouting, she's not breathing, she's not moving. Bed for the scraping off of 95's Red Medicine sounds like proper old school fiery punk until Guy's melody line comes in and it sounds like surf rock. And again, it, it resets your expectations of what kind of music this band are making. The track Arpeggiator from End Hits in 98 has a real kraut rock feeling to it. That driving motoric rhythm from Brendan Canty on drums, the repetition of the guitar lines, the bubbling, of the rhythm underneath everything. It's that ever driving force which just feels like a natural evolution to what Noi were doing in the 1970s. Whereas Cash Out from their final record represents a more considered approach. You have string overdubs during this. The vocals are less ragged until, of course, that amazing sing-along finale. All of that's to say their sound contains multitudes 
but somehow everything is still unmistakably Fugazi. Number two, their flawless discography. There aren't many bands that could run for 15 years, come straight out of the starting gate with a mind-blowing first record, constantly evolve throughout all that time, and then end with a completely different kind of masterpiece. We have debut album Repeater in 1990, Steady Diet of Nothing in the following year, 93's In on the Kill Taker, fourth record Red Medicine, End Hits in 98, and finally 2001's The Argument. Plus compilation 13 songs containing the face-scrunching Glue Man, which was a live encore staple, Waiting Room, which is this precocious, swaggering thing, and the brilliant Suggestion, which I'll come back to in a bit. There's also Instrument Soundtrack, which contains a lot of demo versions for the documentary, the Furniture EP, and First Demo from 2014, which compiles, funnily enough, first demos of a lot of the tracks that ended up on their first few releases. The point is, everything here is essential and fantastic. Each record sounds as if every millimetre of sweat was wrung out and poured into every inch of tape that makes up these six records. And actually, all of the accompanying material, all the B-sides, all of the demos, everything here. There's also something great about the way, and excuse me for the overused Cobain line, the way that they burnt out rather than faded away. They could have continued on after 2001's The Argument, you know, after that 2002 tour, they could have kept going, but they decided not to. They didn't decide to rehash out with reunion shows like some of the bands that came out of that era have done. It just, they just decided to finish. And there's a beauty and a poetry in that. The argument for me is the peak of their artistry. But having said that, it's a peak in a discography which itself is a mountain range of really high mountains. God, that's painful. And something I have noticed, having spoken to other Fugazi fans, is that everybody has a favourite, and it's not always the same. Some people first heard Steady Diet of Nothing, and that's what got them into the band, so that's their favourite. Other, for other people, it was Red Medicine or Repeater. That is a sign that you have a killer body of work, when there's no consensus on the best thing that you released. That's also an invitation for Fugazi fans in the comments section to let us all know how you first heard about the band. What was your experience of it? My first experience was being given a CD rip of Repeater by one of the IT guys at my secondary school. Uh, he often would give me CD rips of, of bands that I'd never heard before and I would have otherwise not come across, so I really appreciated that and, and from there on discovered all the rest of this, this amazing work. Reason number three, their political agency. In the words of Guy Pichotto, punk is about building things, not destroying them. While their music evolved over 15 years, one thing never changed. Their desire to be a positive force in their community, work outside of an industry that they felt to be exploitative, and write music that had propulsive political messages. And as has been pointed out by numerous music journalists over the years, where earlier punk and hardcore rallied against societal ills in a more general way, Fugazi were always very pointed about their lyricism. Ian Ian wanted to encourage listeners to think twice, open their eyes, see the problems in the world around them. Early track suggestion takes the perspective of a woman being harassed, and the first line that's crooned is, why can't I walk down the street free of suggestion. You'll never find a real Fugazi t-shirt other than this semi-authorised bootleg that was floating around in the 90s. Why? Because the band, wherever possible, tried to speak out against the rampant consumerist culture that pervaded the Western world. They felt that that was, you know, at the root of the problems that we experience as a society and still do now. Uh, and that actually extended to them not even making merchandise for their fans. Just listen to the middle eight lyrics in the track Merchandise. You are not what you own. Dear Justice Letter from second record Steady Diet of Nothing is written to Justice Brennan, who used to sit on the Supreme Court, but then had just retired. A very liberal judge, he stood up for pro-choice. He was against segregation, he was against the death penalty. But when he retired, it opened up for more Republican influence to leak into the Supreme Court. And it was a thing that Fugazi felt people should know about, so they included this in their record. See, that's the pointed and specific nature of their lyricism, making sure that they're giving specific examples to people listening about what's going wrong. Away from their lyrics, Fugazi lived the ethos that they wanted to better the world around them. They would donate to local DC charities, they'd play benefit concerts and raise money for the most vulnerable in society. They played in rallies outside the US Capitol. They lived and breathed their punkness, and they never sold out to a major label and lived the cliche rock star life that they quite easily could have with the level of influence that they had, and the level of fans that they had, and the record sales. 
but they didn't. Take a look at this impressive bit of data visualization from a designer called Carney Clears. It does a great job of showing exactly the kinds of causes the band cared about and raised money for. To see more of Carney's great data viz work on the band, Links in the description. Reason number four, they're incendiary live shows. Ian Mackay said to Michael Azerard in this excellent book, Our Band Could Be Your Life, which I absolutely recommend that you check out, that the band thought of the records as the menu and the live shows as the meal. It will always be one of my biggest failings as a music fan, a music obsessive, that I never got to experience a Fugazi show. Granted, not really my fault, bearing in mind the last show they played was in November 2002 in London. And although I did live about a two hour drive away, I was also only 10 years old and not really aware of Fugazi's existence. That may or may not be a good enough excuse. As such, all my experiences of the band in a live setting are YouTube rips of shows that they did over the years, the excellent instrument documentary, which gives you some insight into the sheer stamina of their performances. And last but by no means least, the plethora of live show mixes you can purchase from Discord's site. There are more than 800 recordings, all available to buy for $5 each, which I think is really generous. The recordings are a little bit hit and miss in quality, but handily all rated by the band, so you can pick your poison and decide what you want to listen to. And even though it pains me to say it as someone who will never get to see it in the flesh, but Fugazi were a band that thrived on stage. We're talking extended rhythmic improvisations, squalling feedback, Guy throwing himself around the stage, Brendan hitting that infamous bell that looks as if he stole it from the steeple of a church in a quiet English village. They played so many gigs together throughout those 15 years that they had that rare telepathic ability to be able to morph between songs and create those stretches of improvisations that were really exciting to listen to and watch and also not yawn inducing like a lot of bands when they start to jam. That is why you need to get on the live shows and soak up some of that magic that they had performing together. Reason number five, the respect for their fans. Continuing on the subject of live shows, isn't it refreshing to find a band who lived and died by the notion that shows should only be $5 a ticket? The gang made sure they played all ages venues so young fans could also get in to watch them. And they weren't interested in scalping fans, you know, or, or putting on arena shows that they absolutely could have commanded with the fame that they had. No, they would rather play a smaller venue, which was all ages and allowed them to charge $5 or close enough to $5 per ticket. At the gigs themselves, Ian would famously berate the crowd and call them out for being twats. You know, it happened all the time. He would maybe ask them politely to stop or he'd pull them up on stage. At one point in the instrument documentary, Guy calls someone an ice cream eating motherfucker, which has gone down as being one of the uh, the most well-known uh, jibes from band to audience. From one instance, which you can also see on the instrument documentary, Ian pulls this guy on stage who spat at him from the crowd, and he puts him in a firm but friendly headlock and asks him to apologize. Uh, and when the guy doesn't, he ejects him from the gig. The band even had a stack of envelopes by the side of the stage with $5 bills in them that they would give back to the people that they kicked out of the show. And okay, maybe none of this moves you quite as much because like me, you'll never get to see them play live now. But the respect to their fans carries on throughout the indefinite hiatus that they've been on since 2002. They're not gouging us with endless reissues like major labels would. They're not bombarding us with Fugazi beach towels. You don't hear their music on car commercials. Commercials. Their insistence to respect everything that people loved about Fugazi means the band has been spared being fucked into oblivion by the grinding gears of consumerism. All that's left is their riotous, explosive music. And that's the way it should be. Let me know if I've convinced you. Uh, if not, who is the greatest band of all time? And uh, let me know and see if I can cover it on a future video. I'll be back next month with a five albums video, and I actually will be because I've already written it, so there we go. Thanks for watching as always, I'll see you soon.